My name is Tanya Pinkins, and I want to talk to you about the media. In journalism, cultural context is everything. The culture of the journalist and the culture of the person who is the subject of the story. My dear friend, the brilliant actor, Wendell Pierce told me a long time ago that before you do an interview, you need to know what is the story that they are writing. Because the story has been decided before they sit down and talk with you. And you need to know what that story is because you have to decide whether you want to be quoted alongside that story. So for instance, if someone was doing a story about how terrible someone you admired was, would you want to be quoted in that story even if all you had to say was kind things? Something to think about. Uh, deep. I'm certainly willing to have a conversation with you. I think it would be an important one for uh, all journalists to uh, think about cultural context when you're uh, interviewing someone and how what you say about them will be perceived by them and their community. Um, you know, um, for me, being uh, framed as someone who just goes around saying, uh, I, don't, I don't stay in rooms where there's bullshit, uh, is a framing of me as an inarticulate inward. And it disturbed me a lot enough for me to spend a lot of hours making a video to address it. Uh, I don't think that was your intention, but that's how I experienced it. And uh, if you don't know about phenomenology, uh, look it up. Uh, phenomenology is uh, uh, a philosophy that says that there is no objective reality. There's only the world that each of us experiences. And for Playbill, there had been another article by Logan, I don't remember their name, uh, the day before. And from my cultural context, the first article by Logan was definitely trying to throw me under the bus. The choice of language, the tone. Now, when I was approached to speak with Deep Tron, I knew that I was going to be talking to the conservative, uh, publication of the American Theater, a magazine that is in every theater in America. And so I was aware that the story was going to support whatever their narrative is. What settler colonial capitalism does, it's very reductive to be reduced to uh, someone who just doesn't deal with bullshit, uh, which uh, also puts me in that trope of the sassy black girl. Um, I knew what I was getting into when I agreed to interview with um, Playbill. But I, you know, really believe that uh, some good can come out of anything. And if uh, my going through that gives me the opportunity to uh, plant some seeds or lay a path to show other people the pitfalls and holes you can fall in uh, when you are uh, in the public, learn from my uh, mistakes, errors, um, yeah. Uh, my uh, essay, my open letter to Jesse Green had struck a chord. And so what um, Dr. Greg Carr has said is that the social structure, which is how the world views oneself, always tries to recruit you to their narrative. And if they can't recruit you, then they try to ignore you. And if they can't ignore you, then they try to destroy you. And if they can't destroy you, then they'll try to recruit you again. It is a cycle and not everyone gets these, this cycle, this S cycle doesn't play out on every person. It plays out on people who have something of interest or of value to the social structure. So I have had in my life times where people have tried to recruit me for things, for 
organizations or many things. I have had times when I've been ignored and I've had times when uh, there's been an attempt to destroy me. Uh, this isn't my first time at this rodeo. I don't think that the Tron was trying to destroy me. I think she was trying to be very supportive, but I think that there's a cultural context that made me feel that I had been framed in a negative manner. So let's talk about frames. So here's a photo that the way it's framed, you see uh, one man turning to look at another man and the other man appears to be falling forward. That's what the frame is. So it could be someone who stumbled. Now let me show you another image. When I widen the frame, you see that that's actually not what's going on. You see that the man is under attack and he's under attack by the state and he's under attack by an animal. And so just the way you frame something can change all the context and all the meaning. In um, the Playbill article from the interview that Deep and I had on November 15th, um, there are two paragraphs that open it. Uh, one is something about why uh, I felt the need to defend the production at the Public Theater of A Raisin in the Sun. I don't recall ever saying that or ever feeling that. And the headline for the article is, People Get Raisin in the Sun Wrong According to Tanya Pinkins. Now, those may be factual, truthful things in terms of language, or maybe not. Um, the context is everything. So that's not my perspective of what I wrote. And so I wanna talk about how frames can affect people culturally. I'm also going to share the complete unedited interview uh, with Deep because one of the things I find as a person who gets asked what I think is that you spend hours sometimes having a conversation with someone and it's reduced to a paragraph, a sentence. And you feel like you said all these amazing, profound things and you were thinking them in the moment. You didn't even know you needed to say them more. And you, and you, you think, wow, that was great. Can't wait to see that in print. And none of it ends up in print because the story was decided before you were interviewed and they're looking for what's gonna support the story. So I don't know Deep's culture well enough to talk about her cultural context. So I'm going to uh, risk offending for the sake of opening a conversation. And the conversation is that for me, the fact that the first two paragraphs of uh, Deep's article uh, frame me uh, saying, uh, I don't stand, I don't stay in rooms where there's bullshit. And then there's another paragraph that says, and here's another way where she doesn't stand for bullshit. Now, for me, uh, I know that most people don't like to read, and I know that most people only read maybe the first one or two paragraphs. So if the opening is uh, negative, people aren't gonna go any further. And for me, framing me in the first couple of paragraphs as someone who uses cuss words, swear words, for me, that was reducing me and all of my intelligence and articulateness to being, um, I'm going to say an N-word, someone who is inarticulate and someone who can be dismissed. And to me, that was uh, undermining to the 5,000 words that was historical and social and about equality and justice and so many things. So I do not in any way think that that is what Deep Tron was trying to do. Perhaps in her culture, when someone can say, I don't stand for bullshit, it makes them powerful or badass or a superhero. I don't know. Since so much of the article was positive, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt that she was trying to say something powerful about me. But having lived in this black female body for 60 years, I know that that is not how the white 
dominant culture ever views me. Uh, this came up a lot when I was doing Rashida speaking. The uh, crew and team around me did not understand how the audience was going to view my character. And I'm here explaining to Deep that framing me with cuss words in my mouth makes me sound like an inarticulate N-word and allows a uh, white dominant culture audience to dismiss everything I say after that. So I'm going to uh, now share with you the full 45 minute uh, interview with Dee. And I saw the production and I, and I thought, oh, Jesse Green told me it was bad, but this is fantastic. Like, what does he mean? And so I tweeted, and so I got to, I read the review again, and I, it, it, it occurred to me that, oh, it was because it doesn't end in a way where white people can feel good about themselves. <laughs> yeah. And then I tweeted that. And then I had some angry responses, <gasps> including some people who sent the tweets to my boss. Oh my God. Yes, it, yeah. And someone called me Trumpian. <gasps> so this play inspires some very interesting reactions in people who think that they own it. Yes. So. That was a weird thing I wow. thought I should share with you. Wow. The play is so brilliant. And every time I do it, I hear something new. And I mean, you think this woman was 25. She was writing this in her 20s. Who in their 20s has the mind to oh do God. what she did? Yeah. Uh, Tanya? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the fact that, because it's so interesting to me, this production, the way I think a lot of people don't are struggle with it is because of the ending, which they say is not what she intended. How do they know what she intended? <laughs> I mean, you know, Imani, um, Imani Perry, who was her biographer, said all of her diaries, she talks about her frustration with the way this play was perceived. She was never happy with the way this play was perceived. She wrote the screenplay for this movie to reiterate and, and broaden the political arguments in it. And the studio scrapped her screenplay. So people can go and read the screenplay and see what she intended. She was d doing something revolutionary. She called it a protest play. It was not ever meant to be naturalism or realism. It was something in between. She even envisioned a ballet in the middle where each character got to dance out their inner dreams, you know? Mm hmm And then what happened? You know, and then you get with the people who have the power to make it get into the world, and you're 20-some years old, and they're saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get you this movie star, and we got you this, and we're going to Broadway. You know what I mean? Like, you get with the people who are going to make it happen, and you think they know what they know and you go along with that because they are the people who can make it happen. Yeah. And I also feel like it, 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 it must, it, it's like I saw trouble in mind last season and it feels like something similar to that where in order for it to go to Broadway, you have to take some of the teeth out of it. Yeah. I, yeah, I would say so. And so in reconceptualizing this production, like what were the conversations like with Robert O'Hara? No Did table work, in? none, mm -hmm. no table work. Robert knew what he wanted. Um, he's, this is, I think maybe his third time putting it up. Um, I'm sure there are a few little changes, but he knew what he wanted um, in terms of his design team, in terms of how it was staged and blocked and then People could bring in, um, you know, things that they creatively wanted to bring in. For instance, mm -hmm. um, you know, I brought, I just did this stroke and he yeah. liked it. He was like, that's my, that's my, that's my grandma right there. That's her. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know, you know, in that generation, you had somebody was sick at home all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you got no insurance, you got no doc, you, you know, that is the reality of that. And since Lorraine really wanted that, you know, poor Chicago, 
that was what she said. This is a specific play about a specific black family. I was like, that's the specifics of my family. I want to bring that as an artist to this. Um, yeah. Not, not taking the plant. I, I, you know, it's like the plant belongs to this space um, that we brought Walter in. Um, you know, Walter can't go with us, Big Walter. And so the leaving the plant, it's because she's going to a garden. It's a house plant. She's, you know, hoping to go to some place that's going to be an expansion of her horizons. That plant can't go in a garden. <laughs> Yeah, and can you, can you tell me more about? Actually, no. I have I have this other question. Actually, what goes back to what you were saying before? As a, if it was a protest play, what exactly was Lorraine Hansberry protesting? I know it's a very obvious thing, but I don't think it's obvious to a lot of people. I think she was protesting the misogyny and sexism of black men in that time. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know she gives you all kinds of men. It's not like she's just hating on men. She's got, you've got, um, you've got Murchison, you've got Asagai, but you have this specific black man who is a drag on this family, who thinks that this money should go for him. And he, mm -hmm. he I mean, like how anybody ever turned it into a play about a black man's dreams? You're like... That becomes the question because that's certainly how I always saw it. That's certainly how it was always portrayed. It's only in living inside this production that I began to see like, oh my God, that's not ever what she wrote. Um, she really from start to finish, Walter Lee is this misogynist drag on these women. And in the end, he really only succumbs to what they always knew and wanted in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's a, I, for me, it was a play about a black man who finally learns to how, how to listen to women in his life and not talk at them. Yes. 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 And, the, I mean, and you, you touch on this in your Medium post about Jesse Green, but do you think the reason that it's always been interpreted as a play about a black man's dream is it because most of the critics who have ever seen the play, the play for big publications are men? I would definitely say that probably has to do with it, but Robert O'Hara is a man. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's not just a man thing. Um, I think that, you know, Lloyd Richardson was an icon. He was brilliant and extraordinary. But he, like Skip Gates, um, understood his time, his place in his time, and how to make black people acceptable to white people. He was really good at that. Mm -hmm. You know, he did that well. Yeah. He made lots of people's careers by making sure we fit into what was possible if white people were going to accept you and invite you into their, to their rooms. Um, and that, that's not a fault. That was what was necessary. But hopefully, 63 years later, we've moved beyond that. Um, you know, Kenny Leon is a wonderful director. Robert is a different kind of director. Uh, in many ways, Kenny Leon just remounted the original productions with different stars. He did not examine the material in light of today's world, which is really what Robert O'Hara did. He re-examined this material in light of what Lorraine's own writing said about what she wanted and in light of what the world looks like today, which is not much different than it looked like in 1959, sadly. Yeah, and also, what did Lorraine write in her notes? about the play that influenced? Um, I, you know, I told you some of it, that she wanted a ballet in the middle mm -hmm. of it. This, this was not a naturalistic play. Um, uh, you know, that it was a protest play. She was very frustrated with people thinking of it as this assimilationist, any family could be this family kind of play. She said, that's not what I was writing at all. You know, that's not yeah. what she intended. But she had to take a back seat to the men and the powers that be who were making it a success in the world. And certainly because they did that, it's why it's still getting done today. If that hadn't happened, it wouldn't be done today. So we're grateful that it happened, That, but that doesn't mean we can't go back and look at what she intended and what wasn't possible in the time that she lived. Yeah, and can't, re and can't reinterpret it because that's what 
theater is. Yeah. Yvonne Van Ho certainly does it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I hated his last production. Anyway, uh, so what does it? So when you're writing that letter to Jesse Green, was it also inspired by the other reviews of the play that were pretty um, negative about how it was being. That's the only review I read. I didn't read any other oh, reviews. Got it. I didn't read any other reviews. And the only reason I read that one is because I I know just from being in this business that, you know, theaters really rely on a New York Times to sell tickets. Nobody else really has that power. And that's right. their advertising, a New York Times review, a quote from the New York Times. Um, you know, nobody, there was no pull quote from the New York Times. So that's the only review I read. I don't really care about reviews. I'm like, if you believe the good ones, you have to believe the bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not healthy for you to read all of your press. Um, so why did you decide to write the open letter? I mean, what was going through your mind when, when you were writing it out? Well, it took many weeks. I mean, it was many, many weeks. And there's probably as many pages that aren't there that I wrote that, you know, I was just trying to make sure I got it out before the show closed. Um, mm -hmm. So... I mean, I have a very, very rich and deep life. And so there's no way that I could get all of that into an essay. But um, I think that my experience as a black woman is that I spend a lot of time in rooms having to, um, you know, um, be subservient to people who don't know as much as I know, aren't as well-read, as well-experienced or well-traveled as I am. And that's just the life of a black woman. And um, mm -hmm. that's what my movie Red Pill is about. You know, really how black women, we know stuff and people are just always ignoring us and gaslighting us and telling us we don't know and telling us we're wrong. That is what it is to be a black woman in America. Um, so just a continuation of, um, since I'm at a place in my life where I don't have to suffer the slings and arrows of that so much, but I know that mm -hmm. other people do and that I have been gifted with the ability to put words together in such a way that it sometimes speaks to people. I'm like, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. I mean, I was... I was supposed to direct a movie right now instead of doing A Raisin in the Sun. And I kept wondering, why is Spirit telling me to do A Raisin in the Sun? In many ways, I think it was because I was supposed to write this essay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, do you think, and do you think like that response from the Times, was, was it pointing to what you were, you were talking about where much hasn't changed in terms of racism and segregation? I think I was talking about a larger thing for me in that um, I do see, I'm so happy that so many um, black artists are getting their plays produced and getting to Broadway. It's really wonderful. But I also see, and I think that this is the brilliance of Lorraine Hansberry's play in the, uh, the, the conversation between Benita and Asagai, they talk about how there's no end. It doesn't ever get resolved. It has to, you have to keep working mm -hmm. on it forever. And the thing that you do right now, the next generation is going to tell you that isn't good enough. And they're going to want to change it. I mean, to me, that's what I loved about Suffs. I think Shayna Taub really captured that so brilliantly in Suffs that the mm -hmm. work doesn't ever end. And if you get to the point where you think you're the one and you made it and you did it, that's probably exactly when you need to be overthrown. <laughs> Um, so uh, the way I talk about it in my book, Get Over Yourself, is that people are always trying to move away from discomfort. So, okay, okay, what do they want? What do they want? This is uncomfortable. Okay, how can we appease them? How can we satisfy them? Can we give them some shows? Can we give them some jobs? Can we give them some opportunities? And for people who've been shut out, for many of them, that is all that they wanted. And so that does appease a lot of people, but that's not change. That is a Band-Aid to ease discomfort. For me, change comes when you envision something new and then you make the moves towards this new thing. I have yet to hear that espousing. I haven't thought on what that would be because 
you know, it's not my world to occupy. Like this is the last chapter of my life. That is some young people's world to occupy. If I can leave some breadcrumbs to inspire them of what that has to be. But I tell young people all the time, you don't have to do anything we did. Throw it all out. Make something new. What do you mean when you say, like, the piece was inspired by um, the play, the black plays that are being put on Broadway right now? I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand the question. Oh, and when, when you said the Medium Post was also inspired by the black plays coming, all, all, all black works that, that are being programmed on Broadway. Like, and how, how are those plays related to the article that you wrote? Um, I don't, I don't think I said that. Okay. Sorry. And have you gotten a response from Jesse Green? I haven't. I mean, I wasn't, if I was just writing to Jesse Green, I would have just sent him an email. Yeah. Yeah. But like, what are, what are you hoping, what, what were you hoping the piece would do? I don't live my life that way. Um, I think that my spiritual discipline is about giving up attachment to outcomes because we don't have any control over outcomes. Yeah, yeah. So I don't ever look at outcomes. And in fact, I try to prepare myself for as many outcomes and particularly the worst possible outcome possible. I, I don't do anything without going like, okay, so what's the worst thing that could happen? Can you live with that? And so I'm like, okay, you know, people already say you're difficult and you're crazy and all those things like that. Can you live with them? I'm like, yeah, I can live with that. Um, you know, people don't want to hire you. They try to talk writers out of hiring you. Can you live with that? Yeah, I can live with that. Uh, you know, even for Robert, who we know each other, you know, people were trying to tell him not to hire me. <laughs> it's like, you know, so it's like, okay, can I live with that? Yeah, I can live with that. Um, when I wrote my essay about leaving Mother Courage, I got to experience so much hate and that was what inspired me to make my rap roast video of myself, you know, taking all the hate mm -hmm. of the craziness about that. And one of the things Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who, you know, helped me in editing that said, you got to go and read all the hate and you got to collect that because that becomes the data for the next thing that you do. And though it really hurts every time someone says something nasty, I go, OK, I got to pull this up and I got to collect this data because, you know, that becomes the fertilizer for the next thing that you have to say. And that becomes part of what you're explaining about what the experience is. It's it's not only about um, taking in the good stuff. And I and I I really experienced in the Mother Courage response walking on this knife blade of like, oh, when you are doing something truthful that is in a truth that's a kind of eternal truth, it brings up the poles. It brings up love. It brings up yeah. hate. That's what truth does. And so... Um, I try to be in as much truth as I can. So it's like, okay, this is going to bring up the love and the hate. Got to get ready for both. But how do you emotionally handle the hate? Because I see, also feel like, and this is something I've just had some personal experience with recently, and so I'm, I'm still thinking on it, which is when you're a woman and you're, you're speaking your truth, the response to it is, is is incredibly, it's more vehement than it would be if you were a man. Oh, if it's you're a man, violent. They would say that you're being straight and courageous. It's violent. Oh, it's violent. It is so ugly and it becomes very personal. Like people start personally attacking yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that what helps me with that. And it hurts. I mean, it hurts. Like I, sometimes I go like, let's leave the, let's not even look at the social media for, for a few hours because, uh, you just can't handle that. You know, like, uh, there was, there was somebody who posted and it was clearly a bot because they had no followers. They had no picture. And they're like, Tanya Pinkins clearly does not know anything about Lorraine Hansberry's intentions or what she meant and blah, 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 blah. And they were trying to be all erudite. I just blocked them. Um, but I feel like In many ways, the gift of the pandemic for me was that I did a lot of traveling. I traveled to countries mm -hmm. like I spent two months in Korea in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so, I, I mean, I did a lot of traveling. I Panama, Egypt, Sudan. And I got to experience being the colonizer. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, 
started just doing a lot of work with the shadow and um, really owning my shadow and embracing it and even working with 45 shadow and trying to meditate on what it must be to be him. And I think that what that has made me uh, be in my practice is that anything that a human is capable of, I am capable of. So in a certain sense, when someone insults me, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> like, it's all true. Okay. <laughs> Gotta live with it. <laughs> Hurts, but okay, it's true. <laughs> and I think that that is something that is hard for people because we're supposed to like cower when someone attacks. And if you meet it... Mm -hmm. Um, it just, it's sort of, it's kind of like almost Tai Chi or something, you know, like it, it, it takes all the power away if you just don't, if you don't fight it, if you don't resist the force and you just like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I, I'm a cannibal. I'm a racist. I'm a sexist. I'm fat. I'm old. You know, I have a book I've been writing called the angry fat black woman who devours the world. Um, just mm -hmm. really embracing all of that ugliness that people say and go, yeah, I'm all that. I'm all of it. I'm all of it. <laughs> Yeah, I recently experienced that when like, people started yelling at me on Twitter. And and then I basically said, hey, I'm sorry, I will do better, I was careless. And then everyone, and then suddenly it became, why are you all picking on her? Yeah, you know, I you know, sometimes, I sometimes go at it with the white supremacists on Twitter. I, I, I stopped, I took Twitter off my phone. But um, one of the things that I found when people want to be nasty like that, is I, you know, I move into the shadow. I'm like, oh, you think that I can't play this game with you. Uh, you know, like I talked about with Jesse with the dozens. Oh, I come from a culture that plays this game. You want to give insults? I'm going to give as good as gets. I know how to get in the mud and roll in the mud with the pigs. Let's go. And then after a while, you know, it becomes unintelligent. <laughs> But it's like, okay, it's not fun for me anymore. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and so, so what I'm, what I'm leaning from what you're saying is that the letter wasn't just about this review and the time. Oh, of course it's not. Also, yeah, it's also about all the people who want to tell you what Lorraine Hansberry intended. And I think more than all of that like to me the letter was the impetus for me to say things that i've wanted to say like i had written a very long essay that i wanted published and i asked the the people from the new york times to see if the i mean from the the publicist at um uh the public to see if the new york times would publish a different essay that i wrote about this play and about the women in this play and how this play was so important, particularly in this moment in time when women's autonomy was being threatened. So there's this, there's yeah. all these things that I need to say. And of course I will publish that essay on medium. Um, but th that these things were on my mind. I had already written something about it, asked them to try to get it published. They didn't. And then this essay came up and I was like, Oh, a lot of things I wanted to say there I can say here because it's all related. And so um, these were just things I was thinking about. And really, this was just a, a touchstone in which to give me an opportunity and to connect to something um, in order to share things that I think about a lot of the time. Right. And, and to write the, the misconception, but not, by, not just by the Jesse Green, but by many people that the play is about Walter Younger when, it, when it's not. To me, it's not. Or about this yeah. woman who loves her son so much that she just sacrifices herself and everybody else to save him. No. <laughs> and and I don't want any women to have to be that ever, 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 ever again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not willing it's to like, put that role out into the universe. I'm not supporting that. Right. And if you're doing a production of Raisin where all the women are being sacrificial to the band, you're doing it wrong. I'm not going to be in that production. You can do it any. You can do it any way you want to do it. I'm not going to be in that. So for me, mm -hmm. being in this production and seeing that these women are so vital and three dimensional. I mean, Paige Brewster's fiery Beneatha is just. She's the future. 
You know, I know young people, when they come and see this play, they're like, yeah, that's who I want to be in the world. She's she's the revolutionary. She is Lorraine. You know, in the past, she's been played as this like wannabe bourgeoisie girl that you can sort of make fun of because she's kind of dilettante-ish. Oh. And all that Pan-African and all that stuff is sort of poked fun at. I've never seen that <laughs> <of this. laughs> yeah usually each of these women is just one thing that you know is for Walter Lee to play off of and they are just satellites around his son um, and and I think that you know Mandy is giving you a, a Ruth who is funny and has dreams of what she wants as Imani Perry said she's the one who gets to say if, if it's my time if it's my time in life um yeah, I've never seen a Raisin in the Sun done this way. I can't say it hasn't been done somewhere in the regions, but these women and the and the omission of 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 uh, Mrs. Johnson. You need that woman too. You know the one who's like as um, Booker T. Washington said, "Those black people and black women exist too." Lorraine really got such a large piece of um, the various kinds of black people into this play. Yeah, and black women, especially. Because mm-hmm. it's not like, because I feel like, especially now, you cannot have a play portraying black women as, as being, all being supportive of this one black man's dream with, like, I feel like that would be an irresponsible thing considering, like, how much weight black, black women carry in terms of moving, you know, racial equity forward. Yeah, but they don't get much credit for it. I mean, Stacey Abrams still didn't win. Like, how the hell does that happen? Um, uh, yeah, but Raphael Warnock is getting pretty close. It's 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 I don't understand. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Is he going to win it? I don't know. I don't know. That's really going to depend on the white vote. You know, if white people come yeah. out and just go Herschel, can't happen. Yeah, most of yeah, usually depends on white people, doesn't it? Yep. Ugh. Um, the other question I had for you was like, because I haven't actually seen you writing about this a lot, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on it. Like, what do you think is missing from theater criticism? Because you had the you had the beginning of your essay, which is about Justice Green's take on it, which is as a conversation. Right. Well. I mean, I guess the question you have to ask is, what is the purpose of theater criticism? And I, I have done some talking about this because I've met with Rashad Robinson and Color of Change. I think they've been in communication with the powers that be in the Broadway theater about what can change. And so one of the things that I had said to them um, when we met, which was a few years ago now, that was the beginning of the pandemic, um, is that, you know, Broadway really is some real estate owners, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. It's just some real yeah. estate owners. And if, if the real estate owners won't rent to you, then you don't have a Broadway show. Yeah. And if Broadway is going to be about New York and just being New York, I mean, and a celebration of what is possible because of all the talent and artistry that makes its way to New York, then there should be Broadway eligible theaters in every borough. Mm-hmm. You should be able to go see a Broadway show in the Bronx, in Queens, in Brooklyn, and that would bring revenue into those communities as well. So for me, uh, you know, that's a power conversation. Yeah. <laughs> that's a power conversation. But it is that way in England. You know, you can go to little, 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 little side communities in in London, and the, everybody, the 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 guy who delivers the paper or who's selling the newspapers, everybody knows all the theater because theater is so part of their culture. Um, here in New York, it's like very elitist, and so for me, when you start making theater and Broadway the the pinnacle of theater, like it's everybody's thing then that's going to change criticism. First of all, some of those reviewers ain't going to want to go to the Bronx or Queens or whatever for it. And so that's going to immediately cause another group of of critics to come up. And um, 
I think somebody has to define what it is. Are they there to sell tickets? We know that the Tony Award is about uh, selling the tour. <laughs> you know, you're lobbying to sell the tour of a show. Um, you know, I, I think that it, it requires reexamining the system and what is the point of the system. Of course, it is a commercial system. It brings more money into New York than anything else. Well, how can we bring money into New York and do uh, some other good in the world? I just saw this wonderful TED talk about moral moral justice. You know, when something is the right thing to do, even if it might involve a disadvantage to ourselves, that we have a cost to it, but it is the right thing to do. There is no excuse in the world for there being homelessness and poverty in a nation with this much wealth. It, you know, people should not be able to no. profit off of anyone's suffering. Why should mm -hmm. anyone who, because they've fallen on hard times, be treated with less than a person who we've said, you have committed a crime against our society, but you still get medical care and four meals a day and a roof over your head? Yeah, and I think I think the thing about living under capitalism is it requires you to put aside your own morals and to oppress other people if you want to get ahead. Which, or that is what has been become expected and normal. That has become normal, and I think these young people coming up who are suicidal and killing themselves—it's because they see that that's insane. <laughs> that's insane. That means that anybody who can do this better than me is going to put their foot on me? Who wants to get in that race? Like, it's a race to the death. Yeah, and, and, and do you think, like, the issue, because I don't, like, would the times issue be mitigated if, if, like, the other Times critic, Maya Phillips, who was black, if she had reviewed the show? I don't know. She might have hated the show, too. <laughs> it's that the Times has so much power. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also, it's like, it's power that they're given. Correct. They've been, it's been, I mean, that's who the reviewers go to see. You said you read the review and you were like, the Times said it was bad. I don't know, why did you come? If the Times said it was bad, why did you bother to come? Because you, you're in it. Robert here was directing it. Oh, so you came because you are a person who knows certain artists and you like to see their work, even if it's not the best work. You said you didn't like the last thing Ivan Van Hove did. I don't always love what he does, but I always see an artist at work and I'm like, okay, he ain't got there yet, but I'm going to the next one because whatever he was working on here, he's going to be better at it the next time. Do you know what I mean? I don't know yeah. that the average ticket buyer, I think that London theater buyers do that, but I don't know that we have cultivated our theater audience in America to be that, that like you're going to see art because this is a valued part of our culture. Our artists are telling, are the soul of our nation and we need to go and support them and listen to them because they are always moving us forward. I don't know that that is the value that America has placed on art and artistry and it's certainly not what the, the Times is doing, you know, so you'd have to change the culture. Right. Which would be, yeah, which we thought it would change after the pandemic and it seems like it has not. Yeah, this is a funny story. I'm going to say this one off the record. Off the record. Okay. So it was, you know, I've been traveling a lot. And I get offered mm -hmm. plays all the time. I get offered Broadway shows. I get offered regional shows. I get offered Opry shows. And I turn down most of what I get to get offered. But it was really interesting to me that in this last season of more black shows than had been on in like, what did they say, 40 years, that I didn't Ever. get offered one, not mm -hmm. one. And to me, I was like, oh, because they know that if I come in the room, they will feel that they're going to be held to a standard that they actually don't want to be held to. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now we can go back on the record. Yeah. There would be, no, it, you would have had to, because it seems to me at this stage of your life, you're not interested in placating people or in doing something that is good enough. Um, no, I'm not. I mean, this is the last chapter. Um, 
I've done, I've had a great life. I've had great opportunities. I've worked with amazing people. At this point, it's like, what am I leaving behind that's going to make somebody's life or the world better? Um, that's right. really all I got left to do. That's all I got yeah. left to do is, you know, what, how can I leave the world better for my having been in it? Um, I do sometimes feel that it is my vocation to be like a fire breathing dragon, like, like I'm good at it. And so I, I, I honor it. And sometimes I'm like, why me? Why do I have to do this? The person who does that always gets killed. <laughs> they get burned at the stake. Why am I called to this? <laughs> Believe me, yeah. I don't. I, I know that there is no, um, there is no win in it. Like Capernicus, Galileo, you know, you can just go on the list of people who told people stuff. Then it's like, no, nope, people don't want to hear it. And so I, I finally just accepted like, yeah, you are that person who's saying the emperor has no clothes on. And when people don't want to hear that. So, okay. Yeah. And, but can I say that you had been offered, because of your return to off-Broadway, or New York, really, and you had been offered other plays, but you, you didn't take it until this moment, until this production. No, I hadn't been offered anything in New York. That was the point. Oh. <laughs> oh. Nothing. Can I say that? Okay. Yours, you can say that. I didn't get oh, offered anything in New York. Oh, so, because of classic stage. I think so. And, and my letter about we, you know, why I'm fed up with performative activism from black and white theater makers. Yeah. 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 And even as I said, oh, when wow. I came to do this, there was all this, um, you know, there's this, 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 this thing that settler colonial culture does. Um, they try to um, be the middleman between artists of color, you know, they try mm -hmm. to set up something between them so they can mediate it. So um, even with dealing with, you know, I, I'd worked with many of the people on this team before. And so there are things that I'm used to having in my contract. They're not a big deal. And, you know, it's like, um, you know, Robert came to me and said, I heard you have things you need. What do you need? Like, what? what is that? <laughs> What is that? Do, do, do they ask that of Donna Murphy and Adina Menzel? And believe me, I know some of the things those people need and they are too happy to give them to them. And I, and I was like, what do I need? I need there to be no bullshit going on. You know, I'm not going to sit in a room with bullshit. It's why I didn't sign the We See You White America or American Theater movies because I was like, I don't stay in rooms where this is happening. If there's something like these things you're talking about in the room, I get out of the room or I bring it up and we're going to have to address it. This is not my experience. Yeah. So I'm the crazy, difficult, bad one because that's my truth. Right. But if you were a man, then that would just be, you'd just be doing your job. Correct. Yeah. I, well, what advice would you give? Because in, in your um, performative after the post, you said that there is no reward without risk. Absolutely. And you risked a lot. You risked you risk a lot in speaking up. And so how would you advise other artists who are weighing that? You know, I always tell people you have to do what you can live with at 3 o'clock in the morning when there's nobody around but you. And um, that's how I live my life. Like, I, I, you know, that's how I live my life. But that isn't for everybody. There are people who need, you know, everybody to like them or they don't want to be, they don't like confrontation. Um, I don't like confrontation, but I'm certainly not going to avoid it. <laughs> I don't avoid confrontation. Um, you know, I, my, my, my advice to everyone is trust your instincts. They are always right for you, even if they're wrong, because... When you are building your instinct, that is the most important thing you can ever do in your life because you got to be with you forever. And if you can come to love yourself and being with yourself more than anything else in the world, you can't have a better life than that. I love that. Thank you, Tanya. I'm going to take that. <laughs> take it. It's yours. <laughs> I mean, not take it, but like I'm going to remember that and remind myself because 
yeah, it's hard to be the one who speaks up because then people are able to, there are a lot of angry people out there. There's a lot of anger in the world and, um, yeah, yeah, but it doesn't kill yeah. you. You know, people saying really nasty not. things to you, it doesn't kill you. And I always say to my kids, if you have a choice between doing the difficult thing and the easy thing, always choose the difficult thing because it is preparing you for those times in your life when you don't get a choice. And most people don't get a choice about their difficult. It's a privilege when you can choose your difficult. Damn, that's right. Yeah, some people, yeah, a lot of people just need, yeah, they just have to buck it up stand it. They, yeah they have to buck up and take it they can't choose not to yep yeah well this this has been amazing well thank, Th thank you. you for your time thank you and, what are you going to do with this conversation oh, huh what are you doing with this conversation i'm going to write and i'm going to write an article about on playbill for it so. okay <laughs> i was just curious you do a lot of things yeah. so i was like what are you doing with it I do, do, yeah, I do too much. Oh, uh, one, one more thing. Um, were there plans for Raven to go to Broadway and then the review killed it? I'm going off the record again. Okay. Um, I think that everybody always tries to think of going to Broadway. That's what everybody wants to, to know. But nobody ever talked to me about that. Um, okay. Do you know the history of Lorraine's estate? No. Okay, so that might be something you want to look into. Uh, what I will say is that, you know, Lorraine was queer. She was married to a white man, Robert Nemiroff. When she died, she left her entire estate to him. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, managed her estate. He married a white woman who had a daughter who had a black father. Um, that woman grew up in Lorraine's home because Nemiroff inherited it. He moved in it with his new wife and daughter. Um, but mm -hmm. I go by the indigenous, uh, the indigenous interpretation of what it is to be like a, a native person. It's an, it's a life lived. It's a native life lived. Doesn't matter what your DNA is. If you grew up on the res, you are indigenous. Even if you're three quarters, you know, Caucasian. If you grew up on the res, you're indigenous. And so, um, Joy, uh, the daughter of the wife of Nimarov, who, from my understanding, really grew up in a white life. She controls the Hansbury estate. Okay. Um, and she didn't like the play at Williamstown. Um, the only reason it moved from Williamstown is because of uh, Brantley's Times review. Mm -hmm. She did not like um, making uh, Walter Lee not the center and making him the drunk misogynist that Lorraine wrote. Mm -hmm. She did not like me giving um, Big Alina a, an ailment. So um, she is upholding that version of the play. Uh, she did not even send us a card, a note, or come and say hello or thank you to any of us. And there was a talk back ah. about the play on Sunday where she was there, did not speak to any of us, did not leave any of us a note, and spent 15 minutes just talking about herself. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that probably has um, a lot to do with it. Um, certainly, you know, they're represented by CAA or something. Certainly they would have the ability to talk to someone at the Times and go, we don't want another good review. We don't want this version of this show moving. Got it. So, <laughs> so what did you mean? Okay. What did you mean in, in your Medium post when you said the review? review it prevented the play from having a future life well it can't because you need the new york times to have a future life yeah got it you can't it. you can't have a future life without the times got it got it but it wasn't like a set it wasn't like an option for it to move to broadway unless you had like a big break um you know i will tell you that certainly during the rehearsal process there was talks about what about when we move it to broadway but I do not think Joy liked it at all. Oh. That is kind of ironic that her estate is now being run by a white woman. Well, she's black. If you look at her, she looks black. Oh, 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 oh I, I, I'm sorry. I thought, oh my God. I, I, I thought she 
And he had a daughter. She, the woman he remarried, had a daughter who was by a black man. But she lived with these, the two white parents. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. So I, that's why I gave you the whole indigenous life. She did not. She did not live a black life. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So she has brown skin, but she doesn't. She doesn't know any of those things that Lorraine knows. But if you, she's a little touched. She's like, she believes Lorraine talks to her and, you know, she's, this is her vocation. This is what she was born to do. Okay, okay. Not, not kinfolk. <laughs> no, she is not kinfolk at all. <laughs> well, I'm, well then, I'm, I'm glad it's like I finished so I could see it, but I'm really sad it's more people won't. Well, I'm grateful that I got to be a part of it. Now, the context in which I used the word bullshit was very specific. It was my defensive response to someone coming at me saying, I've heard you have needs. What are your needs? And I said, well, my need is to not have any bullshit. That is a very different context than just me saying, I don't ever want to be in rooms with bullshit. That's not how I talk, but when I feel attacked, I attack back and that's important to me enough that I'm making this video to explain it because we as black people and women are so often framed by other people. We are always looked at through a lens that is denigrating to us and I'm tired of it. And now that we have a, an internet and social media that gives everyone a platform, to tell their version of their story. Certainly other people have versions of their story and of them. I'm going to use my time to uh, make some clarifications as best I can. Aware that people can still come to this and see what they wanna see or hear what they wanna hear. It's also my experience that when someone um, has made you the object of their unhappiness, that whatever you do, supports that story. For instance, when you're in love with someone, you might think, oh, he's so wonderful. He eats his soup with a fork. But when the love wanes and the love is over, you'll be like, oh, such an idiot. He eats his soup with a fork. See how the same situation um, can have a very different meaning depending on the state of mind that you are in when you're thinking about the person. So for me, being thought about as someone who uses uh, cuss words, uh, which is, you know, sometimes I do. I don't mind it, I like them, but I didn't like the frame. That that was the frame of me in this article. And particularly after having written 5,000 words to express what I felt. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts your comments, um, know that I think that anything that a human being is capable of, I'm capable of. So if you want to get petty with me, I'll get petty with you until it's tedious for me. I don't, uh, you know, go for inarticulateness and my, um, my sort of comebacks tend to be smart and nerdy because I like to play with words. So, you know, don't come for me if you don't want me to come back. And thank you for listening. Uh, I'm not certain who said it, but there's no such thing as bad publicity. Maybe that's true. Um, but there was a recent um, article where a young artist uh, got very, very comfortable with a journalist and uh, really ended up coming off very badly. And when I read that article, I I had a great deal of compassion for them because I have uh, had my words thrown out of context or felt like I was talking to a friend and said too much and then been made to look like a loony crazy before. So I had a lot of compassion. Um, and so this is an important lesson uh, for anybody who has to engage with the media. They are not your friends. Um, 
you need to know what you're gonna say and what you're not gonna say and you need to stick to your story and um, stick to those sound bites. Is it true that there's no such thing as bad publicity? I don't know. I suppose if you just wanna have your name in the world and certainly in today's world of negative publicity actually travels farther and may get you more mileage. I remember reading a story about a vendor who um, always sent broken product. And when people complained, uh, he did an interview and said it doesn't matter because the spiders on the web don't know if it's positive or negative. They just know that you're being talked about and they move your company to the top of the search engine. So I guess in the world of social media, whether it's negative or positive doesn't matter because your name is being used. I guess I care about that, how my name is being used. And I have had my name dragged through the mud a lot of times. Um, it, when I had a divorce and custody battle, I was, oh, you know, your dirty laundry aired everywhere. Ooh, so, so painful. Uh, another time when I uh, was negotiating to do Broadway, uh, Carolina Change, some very vicious stories about me. And another time when uh, a nemesis of mine, um, uh, their son died and uh, a journalist woke me up in the morning and I said something to them and uh, they painted me as a, a wacky conspiracy theorist. So I have a lot of empathy for people when I see uh, wild quotes about them, unless it's on video. And of course we know anyone can change a video and edit it and there's the deep fake. Hi, my name is Lorraine Hansberry and I'm smiling down from heaven at this glorious production of my play, A Raisin in the Sun. Thank you to the brilliant cast and to the brilliant direction of Robert O'Hara and thank you to the Public Theatre.